Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Learn with the Expert. We are so excited to have everyone join us today. As we are waiting for everyone to join, we would love to have you introduce yourself in the chat. The chat is located on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you don't see it, look at the very bottom right corner for a little chat icon and just tap on it to open it up. So in the chat, introduce yourself, share where you're from, your role or your grade level. Hi, Jenny. Hello from Alabama. Oh, Jenny, you're from San Diego. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Joy, welcome. Hello, Trisha. Hi, Patty from Texas. Hello, Carly, welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you. Today, you will meet three Seesaw experts that are passionate about supporting our youngest learners. They will share about the importance of pre-K and ways that you can use Seesaw lessons to support little ones in developing number sense, literacy, language development, and growth and fine motor, motor skills. At the end of our session today, we will share a variety of Seesaw lessons that you can use with your pre-K and TK classes right away. So let's go ahead and jump into a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you have questions during the session that you would like for our experts here, Desiree, Erin, and um, Melody, who I will formally introduce in a second, to answer, please tap on that Q&A tab and ask them there. This just ensures that we don't miss anything. If any questions go unanswered, we will reach out to you directly and answer these after the, uh, the webinar. All other comments or ideas can be put in the chat tab so that all participants can view them. Um, ensure that your chat and Q&A tab are open. Again, if you are just joining us, just tap on that little chat icon in the lower right corner, and you will then have the option to toggle between the chat, Q&A, and handout tab. The handouts tab includes um, any key takeaways from today's session that we have to share with you. Um, also, this session is being recorded. A link to the recording as well as the handouts uh, from the webinar will also be shared with you in a follow-up email approximately 24 to 48 hours um, after the session is complete. All right, so you all have introduced yourselves in the chat, so you are probably wondering who we are. My name is Mia. I am the Training and Professional Development Specialist here at Seesaw. So I deliver uh, professional development and training just like this one. I create um, resources to support educators in integrating Seesaw in their classrooms. I am based in Chicago, Chi-Town, Southside. Um, and before joining Seesaw full-time, I also taught kindergarten, our youngest learners, for 10 years in the Chicago public school system. So now I get to just share wonderful ways to use Seesaw in the classroom with amazing educators like yourselves. Now let's meet our experts. I'm going to turn it over to Erin first to introduce herself. Awesome. Thank you, Mia. I'm Erin Wachschlag. I'm our Senior Manager of Curriculum Development. So I get to help make decisions about the content that we make um, and make sure it gets into all your hands in a way that feels really, really exciting and special. Um, before coming to Seesaw, this is a new experience in 4A for me. I was in public education for 12 years. I was in the classroom for about eight of those and then four years in the school district office as a literacy um, and ELD specialist, primarily coaching teachers and principals and admin. Um, and I really loved, my favorite part was probably doing our pre-K to K alignment work with our fellow preschools in the area. So it got me really excited about doing this kind of content with Seesaw. And I will hand it over to Desiree to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Desiree Richards. I'm an early learning curriculum developer here at Seesaw. So I'm working on the pre-K and transitional kindergarten lessons each and every day. Um, I taught at the elementary school level as a classroom teacher on the Spanish side of a dual immersion program, um, and then also as an English language um, specialist. 
I have also worked with adult English learners and I teach classes at the university level in pedagogy, content methods, language and culture, um, assessment and diversity. And then I'll go ahead and pass it to Melody to introduce herself. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Melody Barnes and I am the family coordinator here at Seesaw. Before I joined Seesaw, I was an educator in the classroom for over 25 years teaching early childhood education, my favorite. And after 25 years, I decided to switch gears and come work for my favorite company, Seesaw. And now I get to bring families into Seesaw, mentor them, have them help educate other families on how to do educational content and what we call Seesaw Stars. So that is who I am. And I am super excited to be here. I'm just smiling the whole time because I love early childhood educators. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. We are so excited to have you joining us today. So we are going to go ahead and get started. So if you are just joining us, we are going to be learning today about pre-K and TK with Seesaw Lessons from these three amazing experts that we have with us. So during our webinar today, our experts are going to highlight the value of academic and social learning through play and exploration for three through five-year-olds. We will also share and model how to use our new pre-K through TK Everyday Seesaw Lessons collection that supports best practices for this age group. And then we're gonna wrap up by highlighting the importance of family and learning at this age. So we are going to have Erin begin. Take it away, Erin. Thank you so much, Mia. Yeah, so my... Uh, first thing I just wanted to share was, um, of course, as you heard me say, I'm a former educator, um, an admin, but also I'm a mama. So I get to do that forever now, which is the best. Um, that's my four and a half year old son and my two and a half year old daughter um, also experiencing some play. And it was really with them that I started to think a lot about how valuable this play and these real world experiences are. I had seen it a little bit in our TK classrooms. Um, and I wanted to think more and deeply about what does that look like everywhere and what do studies and research show that this should look like generally um, in classrooms and also in the curriculum that you're working with. So one thing that I'm sure you've already seen so much and that we know is that children enter this world with this natural curiosity. Um, my littles were playing with like what seemed like recycling, um, but they turned into a construction site. So they're always ready to explore, learn, and take on new challenges. Um, this in turn means that our families and the environment really becomes a child's first classroom. Um, and that can look vastly different depending on the child's circumstances. So some children have ample opportunities in these early years to grow and flourish, while others have had less, right? Less opportunities for play, less chances for new experiences, and less connections and exposure to language. And of course, you know, being I saw so many like kinder and TK and preschool teachers here today, um, that all these brilliant little people are coming to you um, in these different places. So what I was excited to think about too was how, how do all of you then prepare these students for what's ahead? Um, I also wanna pause for one second and just <laughs> be very transparent that my husband is using a hose outside right now. So I saw a question about audio earlier. So if there's a buzz, it's me. So. Thank you for dealing with it. And I'm sure being remote, some of you um, during all of this that you get it. <laughs> um, but our children enter your space, pre-K and TK, and they're ready to grow no matter where they started. So pre-K and TKs are really uniquely positioned to help grow children in a way that's meaningful and prepares them for what's ahead in kindergarten and elementary school. Um, and you're building these relationships, right? You're creating opportunities for children to develop in new ways. You're building fine motor and gross skills, um, gross motor skills, learning to be around and work with others. That social emotional learning is a lot for our little ones. Um, developing new language skills and beginning to put observations together in more sophisticated ways, um, which leads us to what we see is just a huge academic and social advantage from doing this. So, I mean, one thing we want to do today is just say thank you again, all these amazing folks that are here. Um, what you're doing is important, like full stop. What you're doing is super important. Multiple studies. Um, there was a Wall Street Journal 
um, analysis recently of many smaller studies that looked at preschool specifically, just like, and generally as we think about how that transitions and applies to transitional kindergarten, is that having that experience gives young children a leg up on all kinds of learning, not just academics, but social skills, listening, planning, and self-control. So time and again, we see that these long-term effects of students who were in effective preschool programs and TK classrooms and the types of skills that they gain from being there with all of you. So the work you're doing is important and, and impactful. And what we wanna be able to do at Seesaw is just support you in making that work a little bit easier. Um, so what does this mean for the classroom then, right? Um, we know that little ones uh, have this big team around them. And our goal is just to provide support for all of you so that you can create these types of practices and experiences that students need to gain new skills. So what we had to do for ourselves was ask, you know, what are all of you doing? And then what should we be doing to make sure that our content fits your needs and that it really builds into this space where it's very play and hands-on. Um, so we had to ask ourselves, um, how much time should they be on the device? Hint probably pretty limited actually. Um, and we're a digital platform. So what does that look like? Um, and we wanted to make sure the experiences felt real, real world and translated to what you were doing. Um, and so we feel like we really were able to do that by thinking also about this Head Start framework. I've also read the, I'm in California, I should have said that earlier. Um, and I read the transitional kindergarten guidelines um, again recently. And I think my favorite part is when they're just like, you know, take kindergarten and like, make it TK. Um, so I know that with TK and pre-K are obviously very different spaces and also something that's really um, the same and unique about both of these programs is that you're really thinking of the child like so holistically and you see that in the Head Start framework and in these domains. Um, so what we tried to do was based on all of these different indicators, thinking about language and literacy, about cognition, about all those like perceptual motor development skills um, what could we do to support that growth in your classroom? Um, so we've been working on this for a little while now, um, and I was super excited to have this chance to talk to all of you and share about these rich experiences. And I would love to hand this over actually to Desiree, one of our main content developers on this collection, for her to share a little bit more about our pre-K, TK um, collection, Seesaw Every Day. Thanks. Go ahead, Desiree. All right, so everyone, I'm super excited to explore our PKTK Everyday Seesaw Lessons Collections with you all. Um, as I said earlier, I get to spend each and every day in PKTK world um, and just super excited to share these resources that will enrich all of the learning experiences that you are already providing for students in your classrooms. Um, so first, I'd like to just introduce the collections within PKTK Everyday. Um, we're super excited that these will be five separate collections um, and they will span math, literacy and language development, um, movement, gross and fine motor skills, and all of the lessons within these collections are age appropriate, they're fun, they're engaging, um, and things that students will want to work on every day in the classroom. So on the left here, you will see each of our collections. Um, the first one is Alphabet Garden. I'm just going to give a high level overview um, of kind of what each collection is made up of, and then we will get to really dive into a couple of lessons. So Alphabet Garden, um, we're building that around letters. So this includes things like letter formation, um, some phonemic awareness, and lots of opportunities for letter practice. The next one down is Language Lake. This collection is focused on language development providing opportunities for students to receive language input, but also lots of chances for them to be producing oral language. We know that's super important at this stage. The next one is Literacy Land. Literacy Land has fiction and nonfiction stories and books that students are um, listening to as a read aloud, and then they will respond or engage in an activity that has them practicing those fundamental comprehension skills um, that, we are, that we know are so important as they grow into readers. Math Meadow is the next collection. This currently houses all of our math lessons, and these are built around counting and cardinality, measurement, geometry, um, spatial sense, algebraic thinking, all of those fundamental math skills. And then the collection all the way at the bottom, Movement Mountain. 
This is currently um, made up of all of our fine and gross motor skills lessons. And I'm really excited to share one of those with you in just a little bit. So before we dive into the lessons, just sharing a little bit, um, as Aaron mentioned, thinking about best practices and how we kind of started to design these collections. Um, we know that pre-K and TK students really grow and, th and thrive when some supports are in place. So within each of these lessons in these collections, you will notice a few things. Um, the first is a really intentional focus on language development. At four and five years old, um, I shared that I have a background working with English language learners. We know that all of our students are language learners at this age. So in these lessons, um, students have opportunities to produce oral language across content areas. So certainly in the literacy and language focused collections, but also in math and in fine and gross motor lessons, students are producing oral language and getting that practice in. Um, the second thing you'll notice is lots of language supports audio and visual supports, pictures, other visual supports, and then specific language supports like sentence frames and sentence starters, really allowing us to make sure that this content and the activities that we're asking our youngest learners to do are accessible for them um, and ensuring that everything is developmentally appropriate. And then finally, opportunities to make authentic connections. Uh, we know that we want our students to be learning for understanding and being able to transfer skills to a variety of contexts. So um, as Aaron kind of mentioned, getting students away from the tablet or the computer, whatever device they're on, in almost every lesson in PK and TK collections, students will have a chance to make a connection to previous learning, to life experience, or to the real world. They might be looking for something that starts with a certain sound or looking for a, a letter in print around them um, within, within each of these lessons. And then just a few more things to highlight, and then I promise we'll we'll jump into the demo lessons. As Aaron mentioned, these are aligned to the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes. So before we started building these collections, we mapped out using those indicators that Head Start has identified to be sure that these activities are really aligned, again, with those learning experiences that you are already providing. And then super important for you all, all of the teachers that I saw introducing themselves in the chat, we want to make sure that these are low lift for teachers. Um, not a lot of preparation that you need to do. These lessons are ready to go with lesson plans. Um, the majority of them don't even need additional materials. Some of them you might bring in hands-on things like um, one of the fine motor ones has students making a ball with Play-Doh. So we will indicate any materials you might need, but truly low lift, ready to go lessons for teachers. And then also making sure that, again, they're accessible and developmentally appropriate for your students. So if you've explored any of our other collections, you may notice that a lot of the pre-K and TK collections lessons are shorter and simplified, have fewer modules, and we did that on purpose um, to be appropriate for the students. In terms of instructional formats, most of the collections, um, the lessons within them start with an introduction. In PKTK, this is either a video, usually like one minute, or a read aloud of a fiction or nonfiction story or book. This piece could be a whole class experience and there's sometimes a short follow-up activity. I'll show you one in one of my demos. And, and for the rest of it, um, you can really use the other pieces however best fit your students. For some of them, maybe you would stay in a small group setting. For other students, maybe it would be appropriate to be able to assign some of the practice pieces at centers or stations or some sort of independent practice. So now that we've said all of that, let's really get ready to explore a couple of our um, PKTK everyday lessons. So we're going to start with a math lesson in our Math Meadow collection. <clears throat> and this lesson is called Finding Triangles. So when you arrive to the page, you'll see all of the information that you need here, alignment and standards information. Um, skipping past all these pieces for just a minute, you'll find the lesson plan all the way down at the bottom. Here we lay out objectives, the I will statements for students, teacher tips, and then suggestions on how to teach. <clears throat> so as I scroll back up, starting with the introduction piece for finding triangles, this one does have a video and then a brief follow up. Again, this might be great for a whole class experience. And so I'll play just a few seconds of the video. This one is one minute total, but I'll just play a little bit so that you can. This is a triangle. A triangle has three sides. One, two, three. This is a triangle. A triangle has three corners. One, two, three. Tr 
Triangles can be big. Triangles can be small. Triangles can be any color. A triangle can sit on one of its sides or on one of its corners. I'm going to pause it there, um, but just wanted to give you a taste of what that video is like. The rest of that just kind of shows other sizes and colors of triangles so that we can be sure that students don't have um, you know, one idea in their mind of what a triangle looks like. And then it also has some real life photographs of things like a yield sign, um, a tortilla chip, and a few other examples. Again, for students to be able to see that in the real world. This one does have a brief follow-up activity here. So if you were doing a whole class experience and maybe projecting this on a smart board or something like that, you could call students up and they get to find the triangles um, and circle them here. Heading back into the lesson, the next piece is practice. Again, you could do this in small groups, centers, stations, independent. And this one simply has students practicing identifying triangles and they're going to drag them over into Ollie Otter's cart. So again, we have different sizes and colors um, of triangles here and other shapes mixed in, and then students get to drag them over. If you're not familiar already with our lessons, they do all have audio instructions in English and Spanish. So you'll see that in every, in every single lesson um, that I'm sharing with you. And then the final piece of this particular lesson is the apply. This is where they get that real world connection. So in this lesson, we ask students to find a triangle in their environment. They could be doing this in the classroom, outside, at home, wherever they are. Students will take a picture of something that's shaped like a triangle. And then here's that oral language production where we ask students to use the microphone and share about what they found that was shaped like a triangle. So that is um, one example of a math lesson. That one was finding triangles. <clears throat> now I'm going to hop over to a literacy land lesson. And this one is called, What Do Plants Need to Grow? This one um, has a nonfiction book. And so students, here is the introduction. I love these ones because um, you can listen to the book, of course, as a whole class experience, but then you can also assign that. We know that rereads are amazing at this age. So you could assign that for students to also listen to later at a center or station or something like that. So this one does have a nonfiction book. We won't listen to the whole thing, but I'll just show what you. What do plants need to grow? Hey, Richards. I'm going to go forward just a little bit. Um, you will notice that there are just one or two sentences on each page. There are real photographs and the story is read aloud. So throughout um, this book, students learn about all the things that plants need and why they need them. And then skipping down to the next piece of this lesson for the practice, um, students have pictures and words here and they're asked to circle the two things that plants need. So again, the directions are here. You'll also notice audio by each word. So um, in none of our PKTK lessons do we assume that students can read any of the text on the screen. We always have the audio there to um, have that built-in language support. So students can click to hear each word. Water, ice cream. And then students would just choose the pen tool and circle the two things that they think plants need. And then the final piece of this lesson is again, a real world connection. Here we ask students to take a picture or draw. We always wanna give that option. Um, if taking a picture is not feasible for the environment or not convenient for whatever's going on in your classroom or they're doing it at home, we have that backup option of being able to draw. So here students can take a picture or draw a plant. And then again, that oral language production, we ask them to use the microphone and share about one thing that they know plants need to grow. All right, and then just going to hop into one more. I'm really excited to share this Movement Mountain lesson. Again, in Movement Mountain, we have fine and gross motor skills. So um, this is our hopping and jumping lesson. The intro here is, is a video, and I'm very excited about this. For um, some of our Movement Mountain lessons, we have an amazing um, physical education teacher, Miss Matarazzo, that has been able to help us make some videos, and you will quickly see she is awesome. She does amazing demonstrations um, of the movements. Um, again, modeling language in the videos. So I'm going to play just a little bit and maybe skip around, but I want you to see a little bit of her hopping and jumping video. Hey friends, 
Welcome to Movement Mountain. My name is Miss Matarazzo, and today we are going to use our bodies and our brains to learn two very important movement skills. Today, we are going to learn how to hop and how to jump. First, let's learn how to hop. A hop is when you use one foot at a time to make your body go up and down, like this. You can hop on your left foot or your right foot. You can even switch back and forth between your feet. When you use one foot, you are hopping. I am hopping. Okay, so I'll pause it there. Then she goes on to explain and demonstrate jumping as well. Again, great that you could use this as a whole class experience and then even assign it for students to rewatch later and students would love practicing hopping and jumping. The practice piece here, students get to practice both of those movements, hopping and jumping. The first page asks students to try hopping on one foot while they count to five, so working in even some of those math skills here. On the next one, students are asked to see how, how many times they can hop on one foot before they lose balance. So a fun challenge for students to try. And then again, some more oral language output where we're asking students to share how many times they were able to hop. And then the final two pieces of this practice are the same thing, but with jumping. So jumping while counting to five and then seeing how many times they can jump on two feet. This lesson has a connect piece. So this lets students really take that skill and interact with someone else. So they could, this could be in the classroom with a peer. This could be done at home with a sibling or a family member, a parent. So here students are asked to teach someone else how to hop or jump. They get to choose which movement they'd like to do. And again, they can do that with, with any, anyone else. And then again, asking students to share who they taught and what they taught them how to do. And then the very final piece of this lesson, we just want students to reflect a little bit on this learning experience. So we ask students to think about which of these movements they want to practice a little more. Maybe hopping on one foot felt difficult, and so students could share about that. And then also asking them which one they liked better. I liked hopping better or I liked jumping better. Okay, so those are just a, a quick, very quick look at three of our pre-K TK everyday lessons that will be available in all of these collections. I'm going to hop back over to our slides and I'm going to turn it over to Melody so that she could talk a little bit about the importance of families in early education. Hello, hello. As I said earlier, I absolutely love early childhood education. I love the children. I love the play but I also really, really love families. And at Seesaw, we know that including families and in learning is crucial. Seesaw invites our youngest learners to share, play, sing, dance, and make their wonderings and learning visible so that families can be part of the learning journey. Teachers connect families through the Seesaw app to foster collaborative partnerships. So you do this through the app or you do it through the website. We wanna really foster those collaborative partnerships that welcome all families to become co-owners of their children's learning. Family members, siblings, and even grandparents see all learning that is taking place in the classroom with Seesaw and learn how they can extend the learning into the home environment. So why families? Why is this important? As educators, we know families are a child's first and most impactful teacher. When you invite the child's family into your Seesaw classroom, you are opening a world of possibilities that allow families to fully invest in their child's education, become partners in the learning, and build community. Extending the learning into the home allows children to connect new information with experiences and background knowledge, improving connections and learning. When families are involved in the learning at a young age, students see the value of learning and form a positive attitude towards school. We include the family because we are not really teaching unless they are part of our learning community. So how do families get support with learning at home? So children are always in a state of wondering curiosity. According to a study titled Funds of Knowledge, one of my favorite studies that I studied when getting my master's degree, I learned that students are being taught by their families every day. 
when they're hearing their home language, when they're involved in family activities, when they're participating in caregiving of a family member, and when they're learning family occupations. These are just a few ways that families are teaching their children, even unbeknownst to them. These rich experiences coming from a child's funds of knowledge paired with educational games that we provide with our Seesaw Lessons opens up a world of possibilities. The what if becomes tangible because what was once thought as something that could only be done in the classroom can now be done in their own home. Soon children begin to ask themselves, what else can be done here? What else can I learn? So now we're gonna turn it back over to the moderators. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Melody, as well as Erin and Desiree. Um, it is so great to see how we can support our youngest learners to grow socially and academically right inside of Seesaw. Um, we hope that our new collection, our lessons collections, will help you create opportunities for play and natural curiosity, enhance and support what you're already doing in your classrooms, and allow you to really capture that thinking and learning so that you can invite families into the learning process. We hope what we did with our pre-K and our TK content really um, just makes your job a lot easier. So we appreciate um, you spending your time with us today to learn with our experts uh, about the importance of pre-K and TK. And as promised, um, here is the handout with the strategies and the links to the free Seesaw lessons. Um, all you have to do is simply click on the link. We're going to drop that in the chat and save it to your My Library. Um, if you do need the basics on how to use Seesaw, um, you can check out our training page at web.seesaw.me forward slash training. We will also drop the link to the training page um, in the chat as well. And this handout can also be found in the handouts tab. And we will also be sharing this handout with you in the follow-up email as well. So now um, we are going to open it up for some questions. So um, if you do have any questions that you haven't um, dropped in the Q&A tab as of yet, make sure you drop them there and then we'll have Desiree and um, Aaron and Melody just come back on camera and answer those questions for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> saw that one. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I just put it back in there too and I'm, I deeply apologize. Um, so TK is transitional kindergarten. It is different than preschool. I also saw someone point that out as well. Um, transitional kindergarten is a free, like a public school option for students that turn five between typically September 1st and December 1st. That is a little bit different, like district to district, like in our district, we actually did extend it. We paid for it, but, um, paid, like we paid for the students to be able to come in a little, um, longer than that or more than that. Um, but the idea is that they have this. Um, public space that's free for them. And there's actions to, to make TK more universal um, across the country. Right now it's in limited states, but um, so that's what it is. In some ways it's similar to preschool in that really the object of TK is to provide, is to prepare them for kindergarten. Um, the ratio is higher than it is in preschool. Um, but the idea is that there, it is very still like play-based. It's still supposed to be um, that like curiosity, all those things that you would want to see in like a preschool program right there, but the ratio is higher. It's free for students no matter what. Um, and then um, they do start to look at like kindergarten standards, maybe towards the end of the year, I would say. And for any TK teachers out there, if you want to add to that as well, but um, that's kind of the idea is that you're getting them ready. You're definitely not teaching kindergarten in transitional kindergarten. <laughs> um, and I, I know that that's hard for some admin maybe. Um, so if you're an admin here, just know that too. TK is very unique, very special place. My son's about to go to TK starting in August. So I'm very excited for it. All right. Let's see what our next question is. All right. Are these lessons found in the activity library of the current Seesaw subscription or is it an add on or separate subscription? When will it be available? Yeah. So 
if you already have Seesaw for Schools and you have Seesaw Lessons, so Seesaw for Schools first gives you a certain amount of access and then Seesaw Lessons is in addition. If you already have that subscription, um, these will be included and be coming at the end of June. So very shortly, within seven, eight days. Um, but uh, if you don't have Seesaw Lessons yet, then of course, then it, then it is an add-on in that way. It's a separate subscription than Seesaw for Schools. Uh, but we are providing the ones that we talked about free today <laughs> as well um, to check those out. Um, and we do offer samplings of other Seesaw lessons as well. Um, if you want to check it out, it's a separate tab um, from the community library, which a lot of people are familiar with. Great. All right. Let's see what our next question is. Okay, is there feedback to let students know if their choices are correct? I mean, Desiree could speak to this too, but um, I would say it probably depends on the curricular area that you're looking at. Um, there is some, some modeling in there. So we've provided, um, you know, opportunities for them to listen first and provided some scaffolding. Um, sometimes we have a chance for them to erase to see if something's correct. Like that's one way you can get, get give yourself some feedback. If it's something that you feel like is really, really important to include, I would love actually if you want to include that in the chat too. That's something that we could consider just more. Um, as a platform, we have some really incredible tools that work really well for this age group. We find like the best way for us to provide feedback is for them to like drag something over to check or to erase to check. Um, there's nothing really built into our platform yet where they can just click and it will be like, ding, like good job or something like that. Um, so in that way, I, I mean, we're still working towards that. Um, but we do have kind of these lower level, I would say different ways of just like erase to check and they can kind of check it themselves. Otherwise it, it would be either listening to it or working with like an adult or another child to like check themselves. Um, that's a really good question. Thank you, Erin. And just to clarify, um, someone asked another question in the chat about accessing lessons if you already have a subscription. So you can access lessons um, via your activity library if you are currently subscribed. So hitting that green add button, going to assign activity and tapping on the lessons tab. But there's also a library button in your journal if you have a subscription to Seesaw Lessons that you can tap as well. And Mia, All if right. I could just add a little yep. bit to what Aaron shared about the feedback piece. Um, right. So yeah, not a not an option in there to just have answers appear, but in thinking about authentic feedback from the teacher, um, if you assign these lessons to students, they're going to come to you as the teacher. And there's lots of different options. Um, when I was using Seesaw with kindergartners and first graders, I loved all of the different options for authentic feedback. So you can leave voice comments, you can have students save things as drafts, and you can be able to give feedback, review that with them, um, have them look at it again or look at it with you if that feels appropriate. So I really appreciate the tools in the platform that allow for that authentic feedback. So not necessarily an option for, for the platform to say right or wrong, but for you to really get a, a deep look into the student's understanding and then be able to provide that feedback, whether it's sitting down and conferencing with the student or doing it in a voice recording or, um, you know, you can type comments and stuff, of course, too, if you have students that are reading. So I love those options in Seesaw for teacher feedback. Yes, those are great. All right, let's see what our um, next question is. How hard is it to use for a first time teacher? I would say like, we would definitely recommend we have an amazing PD team as I'm sure you've heard from hearing Mia talk today too. Um, so there's some really great, just like simple, like getting started. There's like asynchronous ones, whatever, just to learn the platform, I would say. The lessons themselves we hope are super intuitive. Um, not only with the modules, the way that Desiree broke them up um, should feel really easy to like click, click a sign and it's in the student's uh, journal like ready to go. Um, but also we've included a lesson plan and that lesson plan is really robust. We have teacher tips, we have the standards alignment or framework depending on um, which content area it was. Um, and then like step by step, like how we would recommend using it and what's there. Um, so, and we include an implementation guide for just generally like about the collection. So we try to do a lot of support so it feels really easy to pick up. Um, and the lesson plans are printable. 
So I also like to point out because there are teacher shortages and I saw someone mentioning about support that it's really easy to also assign these if you're going to be out or like unexpected absences and stuff it works really well for that too, by the way. And then you have the lesson plan printed, like ready to go. So that, that was our hope. Um, but we, again, always open to feedback. And if there's anything that ever can make it easier, like, please let us know. We would really love to hear that. Yeah. And we'll drop the link to our training page again in the chat, just in case, you know, you're brand new to using the platform. And um, on our training page, you can find um, many videos, less than 10 minutes that will um, get you up to speed on just using Seesaw. Thank you, Erin. All right, let's see um, what other questions that we have for our experts. Are students able to use a writing tool, stylus, with these lessons, or is it only a finger? Go ahead, Desiree, do you wanna share? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, you can, you can use, so it depends on your device. If you have um, if you have an iPad, um, they should be able to use the style or not. If you have a tablet, you should be able to use a stylus um, or your their finger your finger works just as well once you have that. Um, but it also works on um, you know you can use these on Chromebooks etc. Et so we we do know also again and maybe this question is also getting to like the developmental appropriateness of this. Um, so we do, especially when we get into the fine motor stuff, a lot of it is again, off the device. Um, we didn't show our, as much of our alphabet garden. So in alphabet garden, we're actually having them like write on paper and then take a photo of it afterwards. Um, or they can trace first just to practice inside of Seesaw, but then with their finger or stylus, but then they can actually go onto paper again and use a writing tool to actually, um, do that. Um, I also noticed some people mentioned that you work with students with special needs. Um, all of our le lessons are, depending on you know what their IEP is or their 504 goals, whatever it may be, that you can edit these in lots of different ways. You can, I mean, delete whole pages if it doesn't work for your student. You can change language. We have audio and all of our lessons uh, feature accessibility um, features as well. So they can scroll with like keyboards and things like that. Um, and, and screen readers work on our content as well. So. We hope that all of that kind of supports what, again, you're doing in your classroom and all these different awesome little people that are in the room with you. Thank you, Erin. All right, let's see, next question. All right, this is a long one. I teach kindergarten for a virtual school. We use Pearson curriculum K through 12. I wasn't able to use Seesaw last year due to the new learning curve teaching online. I love Seesaw and how I can record answers when grading and how students videos and record themselves. My problem is too much screen time for students. There are things I would really like my students to do Seesaw activities, but by the time they do the Pearson curriculum, I think it may be too much screen time. Any suggestions? I'll give one and I'll see if Melody and Desiree have one too. But um, we, I mean, I talked about the space of like, you know, if there's a sub or something like that too, but I know that there's a lot, there's some families who really value homework and I know there's mixed research about that. <laughs> um, so if it's, if it's like additional support for a child who isn't really like, you know, just needs a little bit more time and like a different way of trying it, these would be really helpful for that. If it's um, an opportunity to go home with the child, it, it almost creates a little bit of like family education level two there that you can work together on it. Um, it's the same, you know, you can assign it out and then they can work on it together with their families. Um, I mean, those are some of my first thoughts, but I'd love to hear if Melody or Desiree have any other thoughts about that too. Yeah, I, when I first heard the question, I was just kind of thinking about with these specific lessons, um, the apply piece is always going to be that real world connection. And the way that these lessons are broken up with the different sections, um, you don't necessarily have to do all of them at the same time or all of it at once. So you could kind of plan that if you know that they're going to be doing Pearson, like screen heavy stuff on this day, maybe you just choose to assign um, for practice that apply piece that day and you know that they'll be getting off the screen and that's when they'll be doing something on paper or doing their movement, you know, around the classroom. And so you can know that they'll be getting that real world connection and time away from the device. Um, just thinking specific to the setup of these particular lessons. Yes. And just to piggyback off what Desiree said, you know, it, 
you were mentioning it's a virtual school, so everything is online. And after a heavy day of being online, you might just want to take something very special from Seesaw Lessons and have them do it with their families. Um, as we know, young learners are not online unless their families are helping them log on to the computer, or find the controls. Um, some I've seen families log on and then run to the other room, but also peek and kind of like give them the answer and make sure that, <laughs> that they're okay. Families are heavily involved with their kids. Um, education, especially in the early years. So instead of having them peek around the corner or feel like they're not part of the education experience, invite them in and say, hey, I've got this great tool that you can use with your family. Um, do this with them. Record yourselves. Send me the video. I'm going to respond with a video of myself or I'm going to respond with a voice recording and I'm going to cheer you on because you are doing it. Good job, family. So that's a suggestion. Again, just piggybacking off of what Desiree said. Thank you all. Okay, how many lessons will be in, will each category, in each category will there be? So at the end of June, um, all five of these collections will become available in Alphabet Garden. There will be one complete one ready and this Alphabet Garden has more modules than the others. Um, and I'll kind of just tie this in with another question that I saw in the chat. Um, I won't share my screen, but just I saw a couple of people asking about an example of Alphabet Garden or what kinds of things are included. Um, so the letter B is the one that'll be coming out in June. And so in the letter B, there's an intro where there's a little video about the letter B, what it looks like, what it sounds like, and then lots of opportunities for practice. Um, there's a page where students erase um, like a box that's covering the letter B to find it. There's for them to watch letter formation and then practice tracing and saying it. They do that in Seesaw. They do that on paper and then upload a picture. Um, there will be a time for them to use tactile materials. Um, so that's one where we'll let the teachers know like, hey, you could have out beads or cotton balls or whatever it may be. And students can glue those on to make a capital B and a lowercase b. Um, there's a chance for them to practice air writing, writing the letters in the air, sensory trays, if you choose to do something like that. Um, and then a little bit with initial sound. So again, lots of um, practice with letter formation, some phonemic awareness, all tied into Alphabet Garden. Um, and then hopping back to this question, all of the rest of the collections will have from um, anywhere from four to seven or eight lessons when that first one comes out in June. So it's 25 full lessons across these five collections that are coming out um, in the end of June, and then more will be coming after that. There will be many more than 25 altogether, but that's on that initial um, launch. Yeah, and one of the reasons why we also, you know, focus in on a few at a time is we really value and appreciate all of you and your, again, your feedback. So I think if there's something you're seeing that's really working about this, you know, we've done a lot of testing, we've done classroom testing, we've done feedback loops, all kinds of things, um, and research. But once it's in way many more classrooms <laughs> across the country, it's just so helpful to hear like, what is really working? What do you wish there were like a hundred of tomorrow? Um, and then we can start prioritizing that. You know, our hope was to give you a little dabbling of each as Desiree is saying, that feels like it kind of supports to get you started. You know, we're doing this in June. We hope to launch more in August. Um, I've also commented a few times about the Spanish um, Desiree's working on two collections, like completely in Spanish. Oh, and to clarify, as you probably saw in her demo, there's English Spanish directions in the top corner. That's just to support a child. Like if you're in an English, if you're in a classroom where you only teach in English, for example, a child who maybe has a native language of Spanish can access that just for additional support. Or once it goes home to the family, we feel like we're trying to be a little bit more supportive and inclusive there as well. However, when we do the Spanish lessons, it will be a whole separate set of the of the lessons. So every page is translated in Spanish. The lesson is standalone in Spanish. And we still hope to have the English Spanish translation again to support. But um, the idea is that they are completely translated over, which is why it's going to take us a little bit longer. Um, and I heard people putting that in the chat or saw people putting that in the chat. So thank you for identifying that as a need and a desire too. that just helps us validate that that was a good move. So thank you, Desiree, for all that work. <laughs> thank you all for clarifying. Okay, I think you just answered this question, right? <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. Like I knew you were there. I was in your brain with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one caveat I will say is it's not necessarily 
written in a way to teach Spanish. So that's actually why we're not doing Alphabet Garden yet into Spanish, because we don't want to translate the text, but then have them doing B with a B sound or, you know, or like a V, for example, um, with a v when it's a B in Spanish. So we're, that's, we are working on content at Seesaw um, in Spanish that actually teaches Spanish language arts. We are doing that. Um, it will, we're hoping to have some ready in like the fall, um, but not, so this will be, it's a little bit different. It's more like supporting students, um, like the, the books will be in Spanish, et cetera, um, in, in there. So I hope that clarifies it. I feel like I made it maybe worse at the very end. But <laughs> yes, we're doing it in Spanish. Great. I think we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll go ahead and um, wrap up. So um, are there other ed tech tools that play well with Seesaw? I was hoping someone else would say something first. I mean, I think there are. Um, I've seen people do like videos, like they make a video first in, in a different ed tech tool and then drag it into Seesaw, like upload, because we have an upload feature. So um, I don't, I'm like, I'm going to be real with y'all. Um, Seesaw is like my jam, <laughs> but I came from a public education space like pretty recently. So I did not actually use many other ed tech tools in my classroom because I love Seesaw that much. Um, but I know that there's the ones where like, you know, your, your face moves or there's like the puppets and stuff. So kids can do like fun, cutesy stuff like that. And then you can upload it as a video into Seesaw and then still comment on it. Teachers can give feedback, et cetera. Um, but if anyone else wants to share other tools that they do think play well, I would love to hear that. Yeah, Aaron, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I as a kindergarten teacher and um, using Seesaw for like four years in my classroom, um, that was the one tool that was universal. I mean, there's video, there's audio, there's everything you need. And like Aaron said, um, you do have the ability to quote unquote app smash and upload um, content that you create in, you know, other apps. Um, into Seesaw, but Seesaw will have everything that your students need, um, all of the multimodal tools to be successful. I was just going to quickly add to that also. Um, it's super easy to embed or link things from other websites. So thinking specifically, like, and there are some things that Seesaw is looking at with integration, like with Canvas and tools like that. But thinking specific to these younger students, when you think about using Loom to make videos or wanting to use something from YouTube, or even if you have um, a digital version of your curriculum, it's really easy to put videos and other resources right into Seesaw. Um, so I've had success with doing that in the classroom and in a virtual learning environment, all of that with kindergartners um, and even younger students. So I really appreciate the ease of that from the teacher side. So I think that's a really good way of, of using other ed tech tools inside Seesaw. Great. And I will just comment briefly on how um, not using so much of the linking capabilities inside of Seesaw to allow yourself as the educator to shine here. Because one thing that I really, really valued about Seesaw is that, uh, you know, children value connection with you. And they want to see you. They want to hear you talk. They want to hear your voice. They want to hear you sing the song. They want to see you dance. They want to see you do all the things. So when you are, uh, you know, the teacher, whether you're virtual or whether you're in person, when you pop up on the screen, when you video yourself and you allow yourself to communicate with the child and with the family, you have con you've just created this loop that is almost unbreakable and this bond that is just so, so important. You know, there's all these great YouTube videos out there that you can easily link, but take that part out and put yourself in and create that culture, that environment that is so rich and unforgettable. I can just one quick story when during the pandemic, when I was still teaching, I was getting so many messages from people saying that they were their kids were running up to the TV and hugging it uh, because they could see their teacher um, because, you know, they missed seeing their teacher. And so that created this bond and I wasn't even there. So put yourself in there. And also, I'll say that, like working with our youngest learners, less is more. So um, really like 
having everything in one place and not having them have to click a link, which opens up another page or work outside of the platform, making it easier for them to navigate within one tool. Absolutely. Great. So um, that was our last question. Thank you all so much for being so thorough and thoughtful and answering all of those questions. If there were any questions that we did not get to, we will follow up directly with you after the webinar via email to answer your questions. So no worries. But as we wrap up, we want to encourage you to think about how you can incorporate uh, these strategies that Aaron, Desiree, and Melody shared um, into your daily room keys and try one of the pre-K TK lessons that we um, share with you in the handout in your class um, when you can. We know that many of you may be on summer break. Um, so um, make sure that you, when you get the opportunity, you say those to your My Library and you try those out. And when you do, make sure that you share with us on social media. Use the hashtag Seesaw, Seesaw Lessons, share what you think, give us your feedback. Um, we definitely want to, as um, Aaron said, continue to improve these lessons and improve um, this experience for you. So in addition to improving um, the lesson and getting your feedback on the actual content, we would love your feedback um, just about these Learn with the uh, Expert series so that we can continue to provide uh, these webinars um, and um, we can continue to create webinars that meet your needs. So we are going to drop the link to a feedback form in the chat. So please fill that out for um, us so that we can continue to provide um, these experiences and ensure um, that they are exactly what you are looking for. And finally, if you do want to learn more about lessons, you can go to our lessons site. We will drop that link as well in the chat. So finally, I just want to say thank you again to Aaron, to Melody, to Desiree um, for sharing your expertise on Pre-K TK today. Thank you to all of you for joining us and all of your amazing questions. And we hope to see you again soon at Seesaw. As a reminder, you will receive the follow-up email in about 24 to 48 hours with all of these resources um, in that email and the link to the recording. So thank you everybody. Very much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.